So one of the things that the state and federal government has put upon um, Martin County is to meet certain water quality targets and they call them a total maximum daily load. And that's just a, a numeric water quality target um, that the state and federal government is requiring Martin County and many municipalities and counties across the entire nation to meet. So we're trying to meet our water quality target or our TMDL um, to make our St. Lucie River and Estuary um, better than it currently is because it is impaired. <clears throat> Let me go back. And, and in, in fact, the, the state government has known that our St. Lucie River and Estuary has been impaired since 1996. So we, we've known for a long time and we're slowly working through the government process to get to where we have a plan to improve water quality area in our area. And that plan that the state calls, and that actually actual federal government calls it also, is a basin management action plan. And that plan is um, driving us to build projects and improve water quality throughout the watershed, although we've already been doing that for 17, 18 years or more, <clears throat> knowing that these regulations were going to be coming into place. So knowing that we've had um, impaired water since 1996, the um, state helped us develop um, our water quality target. That was developed in 2009. And then it took um, the state and the county and other stakeholders another several years until 2013 to develop this basin management action plan about how we move forward. And it covers several basins within um, Martin County. Uh, basins 4, 5, 6, which is basically the Old Palm City area, C23, C24, C44, um, and then you have the North Fork, which moves up into St. Lucie County, and then the South Fork, which covers the C44 and goes down into, um, <coughs> towards the lake. Besides Martin County, there's 16 other um, entities that have to help us meet these goals, so DOT, City of Stewart, Port St. Lucie, St. Lucie County, Fort Pierce, um, City of Port St. Lucie, I think I already said, we're all working collectively to um, meet the load within these 400, 514, 646 acres that um, comprise the entire St. Lucie watershed basin. This is what the um, watershed looks like. You can see it extends all the way up in St. Lucie County. These are the different basins um, that comprise the, the, the BMAP area. Um, we're kind of, Old Pump City is in uh, basins four, five, six, and the South Fork right in this area. Um, so that you can see how large the basin covers, what, what kind of a watershed that we're dealing with when we're trying to meet water quality targets. We've been constructing the stormwater projects in Martin County since 2000. Uh, we've, we have constructed, uh, in the last 18 years, we've constructed about 36 projects to a tune of $72 million. Of those $72 million, uh, the county has been fairly successful in leveraging our money to get grant money and uh, through both uh, federal and state grants and uh, about 55% of that 72 million has been grant funds and 45% of it has been our own local funds. So, so we've been fairly successful in leveraging our money uh, to, to get grant money. Um, let's see, 17 years of constructing uh, projects, 30, 39 completed projects. Uh, some of the projects are septic to sewer conversion projects. Some of the projects we did get credit for the for the Veterans Memorial Bridge. We did some some water quality uh, work uh, there. So so we got a couple uh, uh, we did a couple projects and got a couple credits uh, or some credits uh, to the BM um, to the uh, BMAP. Uh, over 85 million spent. Uh, 85 million, that does include the, the septic to sewer conversions. Uh, yeah, 11, 11 was spent on, on the sewer. Uh, more than 13,800 acres in Martin County has been, has been treated. This is, the, this is the scale of where we're at. Um, the, the BMAP and the TMDL process that Diane was explaining, it is a 15-year process. The, it was adopted, the, 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 uh, 
BMAP was adopted in 2013. It is split up into three five-year uh, increments. So we're here at, at 2018. We were supposed to have 30% of our, of our reduction goal met uh, by 2018. And where we are is we've actually met our total nitrogen reduction by 133%. So we are we have completely met our TMDL requirements uh, for, for nitrogen. Uh, we're, we're lacking a little bit on phosphorus. We've, we've met the, the total reduction load for phosphorus. It's about 57%, but we are over, we are over the 30% that, we we that we were supposed to accomplish um, by the end of the first iteration. With that said, it, we are at the end of this first iteration going into the second iteration. Uh, and, and at each of those intervals, um, all the stakeholders get together, uh, we reevaluate, things do change, okay? Uh, we, we're talking about uh, changing the, the model in which improving the, upon the model in which we, we calculate these, these numbers. Um, so, so these numbers can shift, uh, you know, somewhat. So, you know, in next year when we come back, uh, th this number may be a little less, it may be a little more. Same thing with total phosphorus. And, and that would be due to um, the refinement of the model as we go through this TMDL process. To speak specifically to Old Palm City and this project, the Ripple project, what we are looking to do is we're looking to, we're looking to use uh, this piece of property, which is owned by the county. We're looking to use this piece of property owned by the county. And we're looking to use this property uh, owned by the county. And, and maybe something out here within this uh, road right of way. Um, and, and interconnect these, these pieces of property with, uh, with underground uh, pipe system. So uh, as the water flows, uh, as, the rain, as the rain falls, it creates runoff. Runoff uh, goes, out to the, goes out to the swales. We capture it in catch basins and we pipe it into, into these storage areas. Uh, we're looking at, uh, at lakes. We're looking at uh, stormwater treatment areas, which is, uh, which is a shallow water body uh, planted with plants. It's, and we are uh, design engineers and landscape architects on this project and just kind of wanted to give you a, a broad overview of some of the treatment options that we're looking at for some of the sites. Okay, just in general, um, the northern site, you know, we're looking at a wet detention area. The middle site, we're looking at a bioswale or wetland. Same with the southern site, and then possibly uh, before discharge to the river, we're looking at a, a dry retention type. Um, form of treatment. Uh, we're going to go through the different types of uh, treatment options that we're going to be looking at. First is wet detention. What is wet detention? Uh, you know, in, in essence, it's a lake. Um, what does it do? It uh, contains a permanent pool volume, which you know, means it always has water, overlying a zone in which the stormwater fluctuating volume temporary increases the, temporarily increases the depth, meaning the lake gets higher when you get rainfall. And then there's also a shallow littoral zone that acts as a biological filter, and these are typically close to the banks. Wet detention pond design, uh, we're limited uh, on this project on where we can actually put a wet detention pond. We have to design to South Florida Water Management District criteria. And, you know, just basically, one, it has to be a half an acre minimum. Two, it has to be large enough, meaning um, their criteria that you, you need to have a hundred foot um, minimum width, minimum average width at the, at the lake level. And then you also have to consider future maintenance. So you have to leave room around the outside of the lake for, for the county to be able to maintain it. So, um, you also, and then there's also considerations if we're, for this project, if we're going to put in pathways or landscaping or other type of art features. Um, the, the water level um, is also called the control, you know, typically called the control elevation. This is the, the level at which the water typically sits during uh, dry periods. 
and then any treatment or storage that we provide would be measured above that level. And that's typically pretty close to the groundwater table. Um, so, like I was saying, we're, we're kind of limited in where we can put a wet detention on this project. We have the three large sites that we're looking at. That's the northern site, and those two are the, the southern sites. Um, as you can see, we can fit a minimum size uh, detention area on the northern site and have room around the outside for um, maintenance access. If we try to put that same footprint on the other sites, it's, it just won't fit. So um, if we're going to look at doing wet detention, we'll be limited to that northern site. This is an example of, of wet detention, a stormwater treatment area uh, that was completed by the county. This is down by the Indian Street Bridge in Old Palm City. Um, there's a before and an after picture. Um, uh, do you get, Greg, do you want to add anything about this particular project? Uh, this is, um, we call this the Old Palm City Phase 3. Uh, there's actually um, uh, two STAs that we built. We, we built a, an East STA and a West STA. The East STA is east of Butler. The West STA is in between Cornell and Butler. And I think these are before and after pictures of, um, of the West STA. And uh, the, the after picture, you can see the biofilter dike uh, that we put in. And, and some of the pictures that you saw previously were uh, ground level shots of, of that biofilter dike. Uh, and, and we see, and, and probably many of you have probably walked through there, uh, and it's, it's, used, uh, it's, it's used pretty um, extensively, and, and that's what we like to see. And then I'm going to let Chris uh, talk a little bit about the wet detention, uh, the types of uh, plants we're so, looking at. Yeah, so what you'll see as we go through the presentation is that um, uh, with, the, with the five different types of water treatment systems that we have here. There's also a different plant palette that associates with each. Um, obviously, biologically, certain plants can handle, they're more tolerant to wet conditions versus dry conditions. So, um, so, uh, that, that. so, some of the plants that we're using, um, and you be familiar with these. If you spend a lot of time sort of walking around Palm City, you'll see some of, the, some of these plants used in other detention areas. Things like bulrush and pickerel weed are pretty common. Spike rush is another nice plant. We're all familiar with the state tree, the cabbage palm, we hope. Uh, cord grass, um, fire flag. Um, Paratus palm is uh, you know, a native, native palm. One of only 11 in the state, actually, that are native to, to Florida. Um, it does really nicely in shade and really loves water. Um, the bald cypress and red maple. So these are the types of plantings that you'll see uh, around the perimeter of the wet detention areas. Another type of treatment that we're going to be looking at on the other sites um, is dry detention or dry retention. And what, is, what does that mean? Um, they're depressed areas where the, the runoff is temporarily stored until it infiltrates into the ground or it's um, discharged to surface waters. So meaning typically when it's not raining and you know a day or so after a rain event, these are supposed to be dry. Um, what you'll hear us say detention or retention, what's the difference? Um, detention uh, systems discharge to, uh, the, the water quality treatment volume discharges to surface waters. Uh, retention, the, the water quality treatment volume infiltrates into the ground. So that, that's the difference between the two. Um, the soil conditions out there and the uh, groundwater table will typically determine if one or the other uh, can be or will be used. Um, and like I said, it's, these areas are normally dry. Um, by design, the water table is usually at least one foot below the, the surface of, the, um, of the, the area. And there are uh, criteria in design that it must draw down within a certain period after a storm event. Um, typical layouts for, for detention and retention are shallow landscaped areas and, and vegetated swales. 
and um, some of the neighborhood benefits of, of this type of treatment, it's, it's temporary water storage. Um, it provides a platform and an educational opportunity and you know, it's typically used in public parks. So in dry detention areas, these are probably plants that you're more familiar with um, because we use, uh, they're the kind of things you will find in your yard because dry detention is essentially mostly dry. So um, we're going to try and introduce color with things like blanket flower and black eyed Susan, uh, purple cone flower, which you know, is echinacea. You might drink echinacea tea, for example, that's where it comes from. Uh, Fakahatchee grass, muley grass, cord grass, uh, Walter's viburnum, uh, salt palmetto we're all familiar with, and um, blue porterweed, which um, you see a lot, but you actually don't actually see the flowers very often. Of course, we pick all the best uh, pictures of plants, and you know they change seasonally. So, uh, oh, and we also have our trees. So, slash pine, everyone is familiar with cabbage palm, live oak. Um, we're going to use Dayhoon hollies here, which also tolerate some water as well. Simpson stopper and wax myrtle, which you would all be familiar with. I'll just let you. You want me to keep going? Yeah. So wetlands. Uh, so the difference between a wetland and a um, and a wet retention area is that the water in a wetland fluctuates seasonally. So there are times when it'll hold water and there are times when it will appear to be dry. And so uh, what we use here are what we call facultative species. And uh, these are, these are uh, plants that can handle inundation on a seasonal level. Uh, and then, you know, also uh, work in dry conditions. And you saw some of these in our, in our, um, in our dry retention area. So, uh, canna lily and swamp lily are really good in wetlands. Fakahatchee grass towards the upland side. Uh, saw palmetto and cord grass. Cabbage palm, it's a straight state tree for a reason that handles everything in Florida. Uh, uh, red maple, bald cypress, and perotus palm. You want to talk about bioswales too? Yeah. Yeah, so bioswales, um, uh, you may have heard the term also rain gardens. Uh, that's what a bioswale essentially is. It's a, so it's a depression in the ground. In this case, whoop, in this case, um, we're using the bioswales along some of the pedestrian paths. This, this, is not, uh, this is not a section for this project. This is just an example. But uh, as an example, we'll probably have a walkway, you know, along a bioswale, which will connect the surface water, like collect the surface water that will then get piped underground. And um, the reason that we plant these is because the plants essentially act as a filter. So all the pollutants that we have on the surface of the earth, you know, the oils and resins that come off our tires and our, our cars, they, you know, obviously they, they impact water quality. And um, what we use plants for is basically to um, filter those pollutants before they get into, you know, for example, here in the river or our other you know, groundwater. Uh, the plants also anchor a lot of, um, you know, Greg was referring to uh, the phosphates and, and nitri uh, nitrogen. And so what plants do is they actually use phosphorus and nitrogen. And so they fix it into the soil and keep it from getting into the water body. Um, so plants are great for engineering, not just beautification. Um, I think I covered most of this, uh, so we'll just skip it. So in, um, in the bioswale here, we'll be using things like blazing star and arrowhead. Um, you'll see muley grass and swamp lily, canna lily, fakahatchee grass, also very versatile. You've seen that in all our palettes, uh, salt palmetto, blue flag iris, and um, milkweed. The entire development. Uh, what they were trying to work into this project was to have a uh, vacuum station house. It's a small little structure. Hopefully we can fit this onto one of our sites. The benefit is um, the conversion is real. Uh, the construction and the design is happening. Uh, you're, looking at, you're looking at the schedule there, real construction in 2021. So now's the um, layout of the design. Um, 
this is news to us this week. So this hasn't had a really good chance to inject into our design. We've also, uh, we didn't touch on it, is uh, getting some uh, environmental information to make sure that things can work because we're not gonna build something that has uh, a negative environmental impact. So we need the land to cooperate with building this building. So with that being said, um, the county's moving full steam ahead on, on improving water and sewer. And the other benefit I heard, which was fantastic, was like an electrical connection for backup during emergency outings that they were giving you. So those are three neat things that are happening. Uh, they seem to only benefit this project in terms of what we're doing that will I actually be able to probably use a couple of their construction dollars to help us do some grading so to make this project even more feasible, give us more options to spend money to get the best result we can get out of this. So it's really a nice situation where multiple departments um, have pretty much the same goal here, which is improving everybody's needs in this community, which now having the septic being, or having the, the septic conversion being involved in this is uh, I think a great opportunity for all of us. So I'm happy for y'all, that's great news. Thank you. So, what we're here today, we wanted to give you information and updates, and we need your creative input. So, um, we want to do work that illustrates the poetry of, as a drop of water becomes a river. That's what happens here, as it rains, and you have this beautiful river out there. And so, we want to do it so that it's unique to Old Palm City. Now, I'm going to run through some examples of what's been done in other communities, but please keep in mind, we're not going to copy. It needs to be specifically for this project, for the stormwater treatment area, and for your neighborhood. So these are misting sculptures, and some can be on the edge of a bank, and some can be in the middle of a lake. Uh, sculptures. Uh, on the water's edge that tells a story. This is a place, uh, it's called Laughing Brook, and it's a restoration um, project. And so the artist took the hands of man that were working on restoration and turned it into fish. So it goes from sculptures of hands to sculptures of fish that tell the story about the restoration and that they're bringing the fish populations back. These are murals. These are murals on natural stone, Florida stone. You know, maybe that's something you want to see here. Not this, but something that's about Old Palm City. Again, some other sculpt uh, uh, tiles and sculptures. And then what about sculptures that create energy? Maybe, maybe that's an option. Or sculptures that store water and use for, for irrigation. And then using recycled um, sidewalk slabs as retaining walls, or using stormwater pipes as fountains. And then what about sculptural shade structures or seating? These are all possibilities. And then what about making the invisible visible? So this is a Thank you, Diane. <laughs> this is a picture Diane contributed because she was so thrilled to see that they exposed for the community a baffle box so people understood what happens under, underground. And this is a stormwater uh, infrastructure as well. So is that something we could do? Is that something you want to see? And then seeding. There's all kinds of ways to make seeding. You know, natural stone, wood or cast stone. And then um, there's also rain gardens that we can do. 